I just can't stomach the fact that I have to live the rest of my life without my mom. My daughter has to live the rest of her life without her grandma because a coward wanted to take her life. My mom did not deserve this at all. Today, Williams' brother spoke what was on his heart right before the sentence was handed down. He, he wanted to do exactly what he did, and that's what he did. He gave my sister everything he had. He gave her everything he had to give her in that gun, every, every ounce of it. Please give him what you got in your or every ounce of what you can give him. He didn't give her no, how could you, how could you kill that woman like that, Terrell? Tell me, man. How did you do that to her, man? I, I just can't understand it as a man. I go through problems with, with my girl, but I, how a man can do something like that towards the person he's saying to love. Throughout the trial, Edwards had claimed self-defense, saying he only shot Williams because she had attacked him with a knife. His attorney told the courtroom today that they will be filing an appeal. Moments after the family of 46-year-old Amanda Smith offered up gut-wrenching impact statements that honestly broke me down as I was putting together this video, a sentence was handed down. During sentencing, the attorneys agreed to merge the five counts on which Edwards was convicted. Firearm specifications added nine years to his required time served. He received a life sentence with eligibility for parole after 24 years. Her brother says, we got what we can get. We're satisfied and we can begin to heal. During the sentencing, her brother spoke to the court about what Amanda's death means for the children and the family as they grow up. Prosecutor Michael O'Malley says, while we are satisfied with the verdict of 24 to life, we'd much rather have Amanda back than even be standing here. Terrell Edwards' legal team has 30 days to file an appeal in the case, in which they say they intend on doing. Edwards did not provide a statement when asked if he wanted to address the court. In the end, Justice was served. Rest in peace, Aurora. I'm Joey Lewis, J-O-E-Y-L-E-W-I-S, and I'm Amanda's brother. And um, Judge, I can't lie, we hurt. So, so much cool is here. What I would say to you and I'll probably say to others, yeah. I can't imagine being in your shoes, right? Yeah. But I want you to know that whatever it is that you have to say to me, I know is important. Yeah. And so, I encourage you to take a couple of deep breaths. Yeah. And then Let's go. I'm willing to take as much time as necessary for you to be here. Okay? I'll do it with you. Take a couple of deep breaths. I'm going to take a deep breath. I'm going to hold it. I'm going to let it go. Okay? So deep breath in. Hold it. Yeah. Yeah, we hurt, we hurt, Judge. We hurt. One more time. Deep breath in. Hold it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I was raised with her. My mother had two kids, me and her. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Yeah. So she is like a second mother to me. Yeah, so, um, well, let me start asking right, so, yeah, look, yeah, tell me about you. right, I'm her brother, she, yeah, right, she, had she, she had a, she had a big part of raising me, okay. she made me the man I am today, what do you do for a living, I'm, I'm a, I'm, I'm a man, I'm in management, okay, right, so, you yeah, I'm, a, town? yep, okay, so, yeah, I'm, I'm cool, yeah, so it was a big part of, um, she's a big part of my life. We was raised with my mother. She had two kids. We both um, got grown, left the nest, and went on our own ways. Um, man, she was special. My sister did everything right in life, but running across the rail. Um, man, I can't imagine when my, I can't even look at my, my niece and nephew too long. I can't imagine what they're going through. You know, they trusted somebody. Right. They trusted somebody, and, and this what they this what he did. Um, I had I, I, I've been around him a lot. I've been around him a lot. 
and I never, he a, he a, he a wolf in sheep's clothing, a little wolf. I, I didn't expect, I'm so glad I met him so I could protect my daughter from people like him. He very smart, he's a very smart dude. We the same age, we talk, he very smart. He can manipulate that situation any way he wanted to. And he did exactly what he wanted to do, exactly. Um, man, I can't begin to tell you how, how special she was. I mean, people, she, she did everybody here. I can imagine them getting their hair done and not thinking about her for the next 10 years. It's just, he know what he did. And I, I know that, you know, I can't forgive him for this. I can't personally, because he's a man. I know how smart he was. I know he could have made the right decisions. You know, he could have been at Daytona Beach with his bike. He, he wanted to do exactly what he did, and that's what he did. And um, I am gonna keep going. I, mean, I, I beg, I beg. He gave my sister everything he had. He gave her everything he had to give her in that gun. Every every ounce of it. Please give him what you got in your, or every ounce of what you can give him. He didn't give her no. How could you? How could you kill that woman like that, Terrell? Tell me, man. How did you do that to her, man? I, I just can't understand it as a man. I go through problems with, with my girl, but I, how a man can do something like that towards the person he's saying to love. He came to me, and my sister do a, um, she put together our family reunion every year. And I walk up, and he pulled me to the side. As soon as I walked, he said, man, I'm going to ask you, man, can I marry your sister, man? Show me a ring. I gave him dap. I said, man, I, 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 you know, I'm rooting for you. I just had got engaged myself. And I feel bad. I feel like I'm responsible for a little bit of this. I just, I put trust in somebody like this, man, and I'm, I'm glad I had the opportunity to meet him, man, because I, I can I can protect the women in my family now and, and, and look at people different. <sighs> man. It's not, it's not your hat to wear, though. I yep. appreciate what you're saying, but yeah. it's not your hat to wear. Um, I, think, I think he shouldn't have, I think that's why he stand up. He shouldn't have no problem doing whatever you got to give him. My um, great niece got to grow up. She was there. She told my daughter. They both the same age, four years old. I come home. <laughs> my daughter say, damn. I'm sorry, excuse me. My daughter say, yeah. Tyler said her papa killed her g -ma, and she was in the room sleep. I say, damn, I can't believe that kids, four-year-old, can understand something like this. But I need, I need her to be grown enough when she, before he get out before, so she can process this and, and, and learn how to forgive, I guess, from this. I don't want him, as a, her as a teenager getting out and all the, going through life and then something like this hit and it just make it that much worse. He need, she need to be grown enough, I think, and I think where she'll be able to understand it and uh, be able to forgive. That's all I got, I mean, that's it. You know, Terrell, okay, I mean, go do your time, man. You put yourself in this position, man. You know, we, we liked at you a little bit, but we, she liked at you, we liked at you. I tried everything in my, my, everything to like you, man. And that's what you did. I think it's, I think it, they, it's about to be leaning. You can't get enough time right now. Um. Thank you for your time, Your Honor. Thank you. We appreciate it. All right. everything down because I want to make sure I get every point. In all of your time, we encourage you to do I, I know from when I read, sometimes I read a little faster than yeah. you know, the other day. So just kind of keep that in mind. Again, I know it's important that we're all going to do what you have to say. So just keep that in mind, okay? What would you like for me to know? <clears throat> Honestly, I feel if anyone could take a person's life intentionally, should never see another day in life. I would wish the death penalty, but unfortunately that's not here. So life in prison is best bet. I just can't stomach the fact that I have to live the rest of my life without my mom. 
My daughter has to live the rest of her life without her grandma because a coward wanted to take her life. My mom did not deserve this at all. My mother was a family-oriented person. She was my, my motivator, my best friend. She was the glue to this family. She was my guidance, my everything. My, I, I, I just can't live without her, and I can't imagine just living life without my mom. I can't never call my mom again and tell her I love her. I can't never call and tell her about my day, about how my my daughter is doing, how she's growing up. I can't, I, I can't do that no more. He can do that. He can still call his mom. He can still call and check on her. They can all call and check and see how he's doing in jail. We can't get my mom back ever. My daughter has to grow up without a grandma. She can't even. She won't see her start kindergarten. She won't see her turn five, grow up, be a teenager. She won't see any of that. I must be 30 years old, but I won't even be here to see that milestone. <laughs> she won't be able to see my brother graduate college or anything like that. I can't believe she's not here no more. <laughs> How can I ever explain to my daughter that my mother is never coming back? And that's the one that she called her papa, the only one that she knew, the only person that she was around for four years. How did I ever explain that to her? <laughs> and you said you never wanted me to be traumatized. I was traumatized the moment I walked in the, in the room and see my mom lying there. And I was even more traumatized. I couldn't even hold her with her last breath. I just can't. It's not. It's not sitting right with me. I don't feel like anyone should be out here in this world if they to kill someone. I don't respect a person like that, and I don't have any sympathy. This man never had any remorse for my mom at all. He never. He didn't try to get her up. He didn't try to make sure she was okay. He didn't have no remorse or nothing, and I don't either. I don't think that he should have any time. He should be in the jail forever, for life. <laughs> and this is my beautiful, kind-hearted mother. That he just took a beautiful spirit away. She can't even finish her life. Thank you. I know we have one more. Thank you. Uh, Your Honor, uh, as, as Prosecutor Filiatro said, I, I will, uh, Ian Friedman, be representing, have represented the family pursuant to Marcy's law. And I was provided a statement uh, from Amanda's son, Tristan Bentley. Uh, and, and so I've been asked to read it, and I will read it exact as presented to me. Uh, and it's entitled, In Loving Memory of Amanda Williams, Victim Impact Statement. And it says, firstly, I would love to thank the team of prosecutors for doing an amazing job in helping provide a sense of closure for my family. The impactful death of my mother was something nobody in the family could prepare for, leaving behind such traumatic scars. Being my mother's only son, we were very close, and I would tell her about everything going on in my life. She impacted a lot of my decisions, she was always there for me. She had unconditional love and support always. Our relationship was so strong. She taught me how to turn everything into a positive and to limit any negative talks. She lit up every room with her glow and positive energy. In ways, I made personal decisions that would make her happy, things she would be proud of, and things she did not experience in her life that I could introduce to her. I learned a million things from her, even if it was not an intentional lesson. She showed me what a sophisticated woman looked like in this world, how to maneuver through life while juggling your own business, while also showing me how to treat people you care about. As I grow older and continue further in my life, I realize that things will never be the same now that she is gone. Little things throughout my daily life impact me heavily. I cannot even listen to some of our favorite songs without crying. The heartbroken memories as I passed the places we went to from the time she visited me at school. With her being such a family-oriented person, holidays were very important. 
Now holidays just have an empty void without her being the light in the room. When things happen, my first thought is to call her and let her know what's going on. I can't tell my mother about having my best academic semester yet. I cannot tell her about the summer research program I got accepted to partake in. I'll never be able to buy her that new house I talked about since I was a kid. My mother won't be able to see me, see me graduate from the Air Force Academy in 2025, a decision that she helped finalize. My mother won't be able to see me advance through my military career. My mother will never see me striving in graduate school. My mother won't be able to see me have my first child, who she would have embraced so lovingly. There was still so much knowledge to gain from her. Actual life skills that I have yet to encounter outside of my school agenda. In my young 21-year-old life, my, the, my mother still had so much potential to see from me. Tyler and me, my niece, Tylene, however, that ability was stripped from her in the comfort of her own home. Today and for the rest of my life, I'm mourning the loss of my mother. Although my mother is so far, God willing, our bond will remain strong. This sentence in no way could bring back my mother's life, but it will keep the defendant from being able to commit any other nasty acts, such as the one that took Amanda away from everyone. Thank you. Your Honor, the problem with the defense's motion is that a lot of what we know about what happened to Amanda Williams only comes from the defendant himself. Why do I say that? We've got video one that was taken at 11.31 p.m. Video two is one second long, taken at 11.32 p.m. Video three is taken at 11.38 p.m. So there are roughly seven minutes of time in between the first video and the third video that we don't know what happened other than coming from someone who was there. And the only person who was there who can say anything about it is the defendant. So here's his real problem, is that he's not believable about what happened in those seven minutes. The state needed to prove that he did not use self-defense. So the state needed to prove either he created the situation or added to it. He did not have reasonable grounds to believe he was in immediate danger or death. He did not have an honest belief of that or he used unreasonable force. We needed to prove one of those four things. And his problem is he gave conflicting statements on very key issues. <clears throat> In the zone car with Officer Vidic, he gives his first story. Her eyes got real red. I seen like a demon coming out of her. She got a butcher knife. I recorded her on my phone. Then she goes back downstairs. That is when I went and put my two guns in the car, thinking she is going to calm down. Then she gets the knife again, and he records her again. So what's he saying there in the zone car? In that seven minute time frame is when he put his guns in his car. And later on, he says why he did that. He says, because I didn't want to use them. His words. I'm sure the court remembers this. The next day, though, everything's different when he's interviewed in the station. Now it's, she told me to sleep with one eye open, and she held me hostage for that whole time frame. And she reached for the guns, and that's why... I took them out because I didn't want her to use them. That begs the question. In the second rendition of what he says happened in those seven minutes, when did she reach for the guns, causing him to take them down to his car? If she's holding him hostage that whole time. It doesn't make sense. Nor does the fact that him saying she held her him hostage when she clearly set the knife on the ledge in video one and then walked towards him with just the lighter in her hand. 
Those are big problems for the defendant in his story of self-defense, which he gladly told over and over again to Officer Vidic, to Lieutenant Johnson, and then to the jury on the witness stand. The state's evidence against self-defense is the defendant's lack of credibility. Combined with his strong desire for the police to, to go up there before Tyler went up there. You remember from Officer Cologne's body camera that he said, get in there, get in there. She wants to go up there. Don't let her see. And the knife's still up under her. He says to Officer Vinnick, she was holding the knife in her hand when she fell. We know from the medical examiner that is patently false because one of the shots he fired at her went through her neck and caused her instant paralysis. She could not have held that knife anymore when she was shot at that very moment. Instantaneous. So there's no way she could have been holding that knife as she fell to the ground. There's no way she could have been holding that knife when she was on the ground. Yet that's exactly what he told police. And I will also point you to video three at the end of it. You don't hear a word from the defendant after he shoots her six times. You hear Tyler saying, what y'all doing up there? But you don't hear a word from him and then you hear rustling. You hear movement. It was the state's argument to the jury that that's when he could have slid the knife right under her body, knowing exactly where it was to tell the police where it was when he was downstairs. Contrast that with Officer Jordan, who went upstairs and immediately went to help Amanda Williams and never even noticed the knife until EMS was up there. That is the difference between someone who cared for this woman and someone who purposely killed this woman. So, that being said, Judge, his self-defense was thoroughly defeated at trial, and this motion should be flatly denied. Thank you. You know, Terrell Edwards, minimal record. He was working two jobs at the time of this, one at UH, and then he was also delivering for Walmart. Three kids uh, that are still minors, uh, pays child support out of his checks every week, and a uh, minimal criminal background. Uh, his father is here, as well as a couple of uncles. Um, and, you know, throughout this process, um, you know, I think he, as well as his family, have conducted themselves a certain way. Um, you know, he stayed on the scene, talked to the police multiple times, and, you know, regardless of what is, is being said about it, um, it, it's sort of like he's being picked apart for, for different inconsistencies that we'll agree to disagree on, but, you know, he cooperated. Um, when he was asked for follow-up information, he provided it. Um, when he was indicted, middle of one job heading to another, he still turned himself in uh, within hours. So uh, he's conducted himself a certain way. Uh, I think there has been a lot of misrepresentations about things in the past um, from bond hearings where there was allegations of he stomped on her. I mean, um, I think the phones were going through for a six year period and there was this allegation about sorry about kicking in the face, which we know exactly what happened in that incident, and you know, it was not an intentional situation, and that's the only one. And Amanda was a strong woman, he knows that, and when, you know, they were reading about the bad woman, and I mean, he responded, uh, she would never go for that. And, he, and even at that, she says, you got me looking like this. Um, there, there wasn't uh, a history of violence. There was things we, we had a police report where he's getting his stuff. He's injured. They see a cut. He, he's not trying to prosecute, but you know, he said what happened. He, it's not relevant to what happened in that room. And and he didn't bring it up. Not that day. Not the next day. Not when he came to my office to see me. Would not have a, a bad thing to say about her. Um, even though information that I got suggested there was 
some other stuff going on, not relevant to the case. And we try to contain it to what happened in that room. Uh, his family at all times acted uh, dignified, not threatening anyone, not doing anything to anybody. Um, and uh, I mean, I think we'll keep it that way. He's not going to speak today on, on my instructions. Um, I, I am going to um, likely file an affidavit of indigency for terms of the appeal, just because he's been out of work now for three months. Um, and I'll, I'll present that to you today. Um, with respect to, you know, merger, I think obviously that's the case. With with Bowler, we we make the argument to you, Your Honor, that. You know, Bowler was a case where there was a plea of guilty. I, th I think you have a, a four-person Supreme Court majority that's being, that's being activist there that is trying to say that conviction is something different than we've always said it is. Um, but no nonetheless, their holding is that conviction is um, being found guilty and that you have to give them the, the two gun specs. We don't think it should apply uh, to a situation like this uh, because Bowler was different, but certainly I can see the, the plain language of Bowler uh, requiring to go to that section. However, when it comes to murder A and murder B, felonious assault A and felonious assault B, I, I don't think that we should be tacking on uh, three and three and three and three. Uh, you know, I think Bowler gives the court authority for six years of, of gun specs, probably, um, if you read it, um, you have to do that. But I think that that's the appropriate sentence in this case, I think, to start tacking on for, for murder A, murder B, felonious assault A, and felonious assault B, which, by the way, that statute, um, subsection G, does not, does not say specifically about being charged with murder and murder, it's talking about different offenses. And so I think um, the court should be contained to a, a 15 to life sentence and six years on the gun specs. I, I don't think that it would be appropriate for these charges to do more. And we would ask that you um, impose that sentence and uh, obviously not Terrell, not his family, not anyone is his. Um, anything but, you know, devastated that uh, life, a vibrant life was lost here. And, um, you know, the position is the position, but he, he uh, truly <coughs> devastated by um, that loss of life, and that can't be minimized, and the lapse did not minimize it. I do find that counts two through six merge, and we'll proceed to sentence on count two. Sentence on count two will be a 15-year sentence, or actually it's a life sentence with parole eligibility after serving the full 15 years. That will run consecutive to uh, two three-year firearm specifications pursuant to count or pursuant to 2914B1G. Additionally, I'm going to uh, and serve an additional three years of fire specifications, again, pursuant to my discretion under 29-14-B1G. Uh, I'll not impose any fines. I will have to pay one half of the court costs and proceedings. Um, I'll still advise you that you may be subject to PRC upon your release. This will be for a mandatory period of five years. Um, if you violate any rules or conditions of PRC, you can go back up for half the time. The rule violations of new following that time could be run consecutive. Anything else at this point in time, Mr. Pilatra? No, Judge, thank you. But just to confirm that, then the total sen sentence is life with parole eligibility after 24 years? Correct. Thank you. Uh, anything else, Mr. Petropoulos? Other than that, we give correct time, sir. Yeah. Should, should we specify what? Each of those three are one on that. I don't know if it's necessary to pursue to the statute again. I have the discretion to impose, but it's required that I impose two most serious firearm specifications. It's all the same three year firearm specifications. Um, if it makes a difference for the review in court, I will merge the two firearm specifications uh, for 
We have each of the four lease assault counts into one three year fire specification. But that will run consecutive to the three year fire specification on count two, the charge murder, and consecutive to the three year fire specification on count three, the charge of murder. Any else that you have to call No, Your Honor. All right, can I begin with credit for time served? Sure, we'll transport. Thank you. We'll be in recess. All rise. Court count recess. By reading, if an offender is convicted of or pleads guilty, do you not think that this is a conviction now from your client? Is he not convicted? Well, so what Bowler, what Bowler does is it says upon conviction, merger has occurred, and therefore, at sentence, the argument was had always been. Well, then you only are convicted of one thing. They're reading conviction to mean found guilty. So you're convicted of all the offenses. So now you're required under Bowler for the multiple offenses to give consecutive sentences on the two most serious gun specs. And, and what I'm saying is I, I recognize that's what they say, but I, that flies in the face of how it had always been done. And I think in, in Bowler, I think there was differences. And I understand that, you know, you read it, that's, that's, what, that's what it says. Um, so, so likely you have to do that. Um, but, I, but I would argue on, the, the, that would be on the, on the felonious assault and murder. I think to say on murder A and murder B and felonious assault A, felonious assault B, I think that's a, a little different, and I don't think the statute clearly specifies the same offense, two murders, two felonious assaults. It talks about two of the other ones. So, so yes, clearly, based on that ruling, they're saying you have to do two, but I don't think that it should be beyond that for two counts of murder and two counts of felonious assault, the same offense. Well, Thank you. There's no one else who wishes to address the court on behalf of your client in this spot. I we've talked extensively, and I you know I just gave the family's you know position that you know that everybody is, all, has been obviously devastated by this. No one is going to do anything different than what's been done in the past. Very good, uh, Mr. Filiatro. I, I should also indicate for the record that I have received uh, numerous. Numerous, and I don't say that in a disrespectful way, but numerous uh, letters uh, on behalf of uh, Ms. Williams and her family, uh, which I have read each and every one of them. So I want to be the pounds that have received and read those. And then, uh, Mr. Natural, we have to stay. Thank you, Judge. Uh, Your Honor, I'll begin by addressing the firearm specifications uh, argument that the defense just made. Um, Bowler is talking about what to do when offenses merge, but the firearm specification statute, U1G, says what it says. Paragraph 20 of Bowler. This application of the plain language of the statute furthers the apparent legislative goal in enacting 2929-14-B1G, requiring that offenders like Bowler be subject to separate prison terms for multiple firearm specifications the General Assembly appears to have acknowledged that the use of firearms in certain violent crimes should carry a hefty penalty. Paragraph 21. We note that 2941-25's merger provision does not override 2929-14-B1G, as the latter is the more specific and the more recently enacted statute. Firearms and the use of firearms, especially in cases of domestic violence, which is what we have here, pose a, an extremely dangerous situation for people in those relationships. And that's exactly where Amanda Williams was. And the text message, and I'm about to read it here word for word, that the state brought up during the trial, shows that. 
If you remember, Judge, the defendant sat in the back of Officer Vidic's car and said to himself, why did you grab that knife? Why did you grab that knife? Amanda told him why she grabbed that knife in video one. To defend myself is what she said. And he sat there and said to this jury, I'm not a, I was never violent with her. He told the police all about things that she was like. Never once mentioning himself as part of it. On November 27, 2020, she wrote a text message to him that reads as follows. Every time I look in the mirror, I get angry all over again. To walk around looking like a battered woman is not only embarrassing but humiliating. To use your foot to do damage is one of the ultimate sign of destruction. And you complain about me being a strong woman. Well, if I weren't as strong as I am, I would have had you thrown in jail and exposed you to everyone. No response needed was her next message. His response was, I'm glad we're both strong, and I hope you feel better. I'm sorry for what I did. He's not saying, wow, what a misunderstanding we just had. He's admitting he used his foot to cause damage to her face. His next response, I just wish the love we say we have for each other would show every day unconditionally. And her response to that, and this is why he knows exactly why she needed to defend herself, it will never be the same. And she had pictures on her phone of her face, pictures of herself in the hospital two days earlier getting treatment. You heard Tyler, Tyler Williams' testimony. She did not know about the problems in their relationship. <clears throat> On that same phone, this happened around Thanksgiving time of 2020, she has a picture with her, her son, Amanda, and she has a COVID mask on her face. She hid this from her family, but he knew exactly what he did to her. And he can sit here now and have his lawyer say, there's a whole different side to that story, Judge. But he sat there and told that jury, I'm not violent with her. She begs to differ. Still. 